Wordplay peppers the pages of Margaret Atwood's 1985 novel, and not in the least because access to words is one of the many freedoms wrenched from women in her dystopian tale. When protagonist June is invited to join the commander in a game of Scrabble, she luxuriates in the long, unused combinations of letters that might result in the highest scores. Atwood writes, Larynx I spell, Valence, Quince, Zygote. I hold the glossy counters with their smooth edges, finger the letters. The feeling is voluptuous. This is freedom, an eye blink of it. Voluptuousness is what cinematographer Colin Watkinson achieves in Hulu's 2017 adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale. Life in Gilead, a nation state in which the biblical story of Rachel justifies the state-sanctioned rape and enslavement of women, is brought into sharp relief through singularly stunning cinematography. Watkinson's deft handling of the filmic frame and all that it contains achieves for the eye what Atwood's protagonist had tasted in her eye blink of freedom. His aesthetic treatment of the series is rendered performative. The composition of each exquisite frame, diffuse light, and saturated color Jarring juxtapositions and temporal fluctuations together serve to adumbrate the dystopia Atwood so deftly delineated. In the Hulu series, as well as in the novel on which it was based, the narrative begins in media res. The worst has already happened. Women's rights are first eroded and then extinguished as a solution to a planet-wide plague of infertility. The series opener drops us into a horrifyingly vivid scene where June, her husband, and their young daughter are fleeing to Canada to escape the madness. June is captured, her child taken from her, and her husband shot. Like any rootstock narrative, The Handmaid's Tale offers multiple ways in. It can be read as science fiction or a foreboding feminist fairy tale. We could attempt to untangle its twisted Old Testament hermeneutics or deconstruct its ambivalent relationship with technology. What follows is an exploration of the ways in which in this adaptation, the figural speaks. As Alcesser and Hagener claim in their book, Film Theory, quote, the eye is the privileged point of convergence for various structures of visibility. In Atwood's cautionary tale, the literal and metaphorical eye are harnessed to maintain structures of appearance and to ensure the control and captivation of the women of Gilead. In Hulu's lush series, the cinematic eye shows us how an exploration of the ways in which those structures are concretized cinematically reveals the controls over what could be seen and what could be said, making visible the ways in which those in power in Gilead hoped to consequently control that which is not visible, thought. In her book, Life of the Mind, Hannah Arendt suggests that, quote, in this world which we enter, appearing from a nowhere, and from which we disappear into a nowhere, being and appearing coincide. Arendt posits that not only do we have the urge to show ourselves, but that we are also the requisite recipients of these appearances. Those who imagined Gilead's new order were only too aware of the intrinsic human urge to be seen, but also to be the recipient of myriad appearances. If our capacity to witness is an essential element of who we are, 
by extension, removing that ability removes access to our being. By design, the white wings the handmaids wore functioned like blinders. Blinkered, not only could they not see each other, but according to Arendt, they were also cut off from themselves and ultimately from their ability to think. Paradoxically, there were some appearances the handmaids were forced to receive. The wall along the river where they sometimes walked displayed the rotting corpses of those who had transgressed. Like groceries in the marketplace, denoted by colorful illustrations, the decaying bodies too were the mark of their particular crime. This one a priest, this one a gender traitor, this one a doctor who continued to perform abortions, and so on. Hulu's Handmaid's Tale is endlessly evocative, but for the remainder of this video essay, I'd like to focus on the cinematographic choices of Colin Watkinson, which perform structures of appearance and entice, invite the audience into the evil of their banality. Taking in the series, I was left breathless, simply wowed. As I watched and rewatched episodes, I would find myself again and again in the same place, a wordless, thoughtless place, where my only impulse was to grab a pencil and draw what I saw. I felt compelled to map the ways in which Watkinson had rigidly composed each shot. It occurred to me then that I was experiencing the effect of inhabiting what Benjamin called an unconsciously penetrated space. I couldn't access it on the conscious level, most immediately because I found it stunning. In other words, I was stunned. Things of rare and overwhelming beauty take our breath away. They stun us speechless. Watkinson's taut and luscious imagery, in effect, as Benjamin suggests, bypasses our intellect and reaches for the part of us that is beneath or beyond words and consequently thought. When Watkinson shifts the temporality to show us rain, the ceremonious rape, or the salvaging in slow motion, we are captivated, beguiled, entranced, but more importantly, like the handmaids, taken captive. All we can do is respond viscerally to what we see. Riveted and at the mercy of our senses, we are doubly stunned as we recoil at the horrors perpetrated against these women. And thrice again, as we witness the literal stunning, as when cattle prods are used to control and constrain the handmaids. Confronted by the formality of rigidly structured, tight shots, we find ourselves in so close that there is no room for thoughts to form. Just as we begin to catch our stunned breath, Watkinson jump shifts to a bird's eye view, offering long shots of serried handmaids. White capped red figures evoke Descartes contemplation from his window of the man on the street below. How is it, he wonders, that we can be sure that what we are seeing are not automatons? Red and white shapes, now abstracted and reductive, purely figural, point to the dehumanization of these handmaids and the resultant loss of their value as individuals. Taken with the geometric, Watkinson often arranges shots with perfect symmetry, yet manages to avoid the expected static result. Many of his establishing shots, both straight on and from above, depict inkblot compositions marked by a flash of red to tip the balance. Watkinson employs juxtapositions in an almost Foucauldian sense as before and after pictures, demonstrating the slippage from one system of thought to another. 
a vibrant June, first makes love to her husband Luke, laughing playfully above a tinkling piano score, and then, with a rupture in the soundtrack, we are abruptly brought to present-day Gilead. Nick has been conscripted to add his sperm into the mix and assumes the position in a starkly silent scene, broken only by the sound of his belt buckle, the creaking of the bed springs. While there is so much more left to unpack, there is one aesthetic treatment that gave me pause. Throughout the series, Watkinson consistently employs diffuse light, streaming in windows, igniting insects along the wall, obscuring, revealing, softening, evocative of a Vermeer painting. I struggled to understand what precisely Watkinson was attempting to signify, other than the fact that it was, without a doubt, visually stunning. I inadvertently stumbled then upon this thought, Deleuze writing on Foucault, quote, We must break things open. Visibilities are not forms of objects, nor even forms that would show up under light, but rather forms of luminosity, which are created by the light itself and allow a thing or object to exist only as a flash, sparkle, or shimmer. There is no flash, no sparkle, no shimmer for the imprisoned women of Gilead. To assure that we see this, Watkinson had no choice but to visually break us open. <laughs>